to stop what you're doing and listen. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is true. Keels just fall off out of nowhere, randomly, and no one can explain why. It's very similar to the Bermuda Triangle. Things happen and nobody, for the life of them, can explain what is going on. So serious is the issue that any time on social media you mention a vessel with a bolt-on keel, instantly they run to the comments to warn you of the impending doom that will come with the purchase of that vessel and even the thought of crossing an ocean. Another fan favorite is whales. What happens if you're surrounded by a pod of whales and you run into one with your bolt-on keel? You're doomed. Well, sir, what happens if I run into a tree with my car? I'm pretty fucked. So ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look today and see where did all of this come from? Is it true? Is it really a fact that the most popular keel type in the entire world is just an absolute sham? And they're putting all of our lives at risk just to make money? Is that a possibility? Is that what's going on? Or is it the fact that people don't like to tell the entire story behind these big news breaking stories of a keel fall off? Let's look at a few of the most popular examples and see exactly what went wrong, and if there's any truth behind, your keel's just gonna fall off. Now first up, we have the cheeky Rafiki. This is a Beneteau 40.7 sailing vessel that the keel broke off in a storm in the mid-Atlantic in May of 2014. Unfortunately, the vessel did capsize and four UK sailors perished in the accident. So why did the keel fall off and who exactly was to blame for this one? Well, the British courts chose to blame Douglas Inez. Now he's the managing director of Storm Force Coaching, which owned and was also responsible for the maintenance of the Cheeky Rafiki. He was charged with manslaughter as well as failing to operate the yacht in a safe manner. Now unfortunately, as typical justice systems do, he was acquitted on the manslaughter charges and only convicted on the lesser charge of failing to operate the yacht in a safe manner. But what actually happened with the Cheeky Rafiki? Well. It had participated in the Antigua Sailing Week event in spring of 2014 and was supposed to return to Southampton, England afterwards to be available for charter in the following season. She left Antigua on May 4th with a crew of four men on board. The voyage was expected to take around 30 days. Now, during the voyage, the skipper exchanged emails with the director of Storm Force over satellite phone, especially about route suggestions and how the weather was looking. Initially, there was not much wind on the trip, but it started to constantly increase after around May 10th. And on May 16th, the wind blew with a force 7 and a considerable sea state that had followed. The skipper reported ashore that the ship was taking on significant amounts of water for no apparent reason. A following phone call was completely incomprehensible and the rescue mission was started. They were out looking for the vessel. Now on May 17th, more than 24 hours after last contact with the ship, a container vessel found the Chiki Rafiki hull upside down. The keel was missing, but the rudder was still in place. Due to bad weather conditions, the wreck could not be investigated at that time. Now, about a week later, the US Navy sent a diver to the still floating wreck. This confirmed the life raft was still secured to its storage location. The crew had not had time to bring it out. Consequently, the search was terminated because the hope of finding any crew alive is pretty much in vain at this point, as the maximum time someone can survive in temperatures of 16C is right around 15 and a half hours. Now, the report of the British Marine Accident Investigation Branch showed that the construction did in fact satisfy the relevant construction specifications available at the time of construction. It even almost passed the revised ones at the time of the accident. Therefore, the shipyard itself could not be held liable for the lack of stability. Furthermore, the crew couldn't be held liable as they were competent and the skipper was in fact in possession of all the required certificates for such a voyage. Now at the time of the accident, the wind blew with a force seven, which is rough, but it's still completely within the limits for vessels like this to encounter. The accident investigation reports out though, that it's unclear whether the ship was even allowed to set to sea under the applicable laws because 
As a professionally skippered boat, there are extensive rules concerning equipment, crewing, and a yearly safety inspection. Now, the yearly safety inspection was overdue because they were trying to save money and they intended to postpone it until they got the boat back to England versus having to fly an inspector to the Caribbean. It is also worth noting that this particular vessel had been grounded previously numerous times as well as repaired that most likely weakened the vessel's structure where the keel was in fact attached to the hull. It's also possible that one or more of the keel bolts had deteriorated. That would lead to a consequential loss of strength that would have allowed the keel to move, which would have been exaggerated by increased transference loading through the sailing and worsening sea conditions, therefore causing the keel to work itself loose. Now, even experts will tell you that they are not normally capable of telling you how such repairs would be properly done and how to tell that it was acceptably fixed. Unless, of course, the keel is completely removed. Now, that was the recommendation from the manufacturer. However, it doesn't appear that it was ever actually done. What they assume is that the most probable cause to the accident was failure of the glued link between the matrix, that's the inner skeleton, and the outer hull. Now, similar damages could be observed in sister ships that were involved in groundings as well. Different repair yards said that they could only hardly determine the severity of such damages. Now, this is just one example of a vessel where a keel had failure, and people love to use this as an example as all bolt-on keels are going to fall off. As you can see, that is not the case here, nor is it rarely the case in any of them. This particular vessel had numerous issues leading up to this fact. Now, just like rigging, rudders, and the hull itself, the keel should always demand your full attention. Any sign of weakness in this structural area can and will lead to a disastrous failure with incredible consequences. Now, keels are also prone to going bump on the bottom. This does present a special problem. And given the trends toward high performance keels built on a low performance budget, yes, you should be concerned. But how concerned? And concerned about what? What you should be concerned about is your boat's history. Where do you plan to sail your vessel? How old is it? And when was it last surveyed? If you have any doubts at all about the integrity of your keel, then you do need to call a reputable surveyor and figure out what you need to do to make sure that you repair that keel. Keel inspection itself is incredibly complex. It's far too complex to ever actually be addressed in just your basic sailboat survey. So if the vessel has had previous incidents, yes, you should absolutely pull the keel off if it's a bolt-on keel. You just should. It is better to just do things the correct way and not wind up making the news. Now, like I said, keels don't just fall off. They never just randomly fall off. There is always an event leading up to keel failure. It's generally a maintenance issue, a grounding, or some other tragic type of a thing, but they never just fall off. And like everything else on your vessel, if you take care of it, it will take care of you. The point is do your maintenance. And if you ever suspect any issues, pull the keel off. Yes, it's gonna cost you money. I understand, but it's better it costs you money than your life. Now, if you do need help getting on the water or narrowing down your boat purchase, or you just need some information and some help, consider heading on over to my website at chasinglatitudes.com. Over there, right on the homepage, you will see producer. Become a producer on the channel. With becoming a producer, you do get a one-on-one -on -one consult with me to discuss everything sailing related that you would need to, as well as you do get a year's access to our members area. Now, the members area is a fantastic place for information. We have hundreds of members over there all in various stages of starting sailing some have just purchased boats some are taking asa classes and so on it is a wealth of information and it's not a public forum it's a private members area so there's no harassment there's no bullying there's no judgment over there it's just a great place for information to help you get on the water sooner than later if you would like to, you can also just send me $100 directly through PayPal. The link is in the description below for that as well. Now, if that's a little bit too much for the bank account, I completely understand. However, consider joining Patreon. For only $10 a month, you do get access again to the members area, which is a fantastic place for information to help you get on the water sooner than later. If you did enjoy the video, please leave a comment down below. Like, share, all that good stuff. Make it go viral. I don't know. Do something. And I will see you on the next video. Thank you so, so much for joining.